one day I was sitting down in the room and I was interviewing these criminals. They were going in and out, one by one, coming in. And suddenly, one of these guys just walked into the room. He was next to be interviewed. He walked in and the whole atmosphere of the room just changed. He didn't do anything. He, he came, he smiled at me, sat down. He was polite. We had a, a brief conversation, but I just wanted to end it fast. But that whole atmosphere in the room just changed. You know, I was like, oh my God, you just can feel how dangerous this guy is. The following is a conversation with Dr. Shamir Rajaduri, a crime prevention specialist in Malaysia. He's made a career speaking to criminals one-on-one and using that knowledge to help prevent crime. And now, dear friends, here's Dr. Shamir Rajaduri. You've been threatened, beaten, and attacked all for doing your job. Why? No, I, I'm, I'm in the business of crime prevention, and there are certain risks that we have to go through. And I think um, if we don't put ourselves out there enough, we will always just be doing the baseline, or, or we are going to be mediocre. So in order for me to understand crime better, to prevent crime, uh, I needed to go down to the grassroots, and, and that comes with a certain amount of risk. So how did you get into this line of work? Uh, uh, interesting <laughs> interesting question. So um, I think I've always been a bit fascinated about crime, um, but I, I, I don't have the heart to commit it. So uh, the only other way for me to, I would say, legally do it or, or emulate it legally would be to be on the side of crime prevention. So it gives me a, a slightly, uh, it gives me the understanding of how crime happens, what are the motivations behind it, uh, why do people do what they do, but also now to also understand, okay, what can we do now to reduce the risk of that happening? What can we do to reduce victimization? What can we do to protect communities, right? So at the end of the day, uh, it also, there's, there's two parts to it, right? One, it gives me the ability to emulate it, but two, it also gives me the ability to at least, uh, to some point, make a difference. Well, what is an example of something that you learn from a criminal that you can then use to actually implement crime prevention measures? Ah, okay. So, one of the things that we learned was, um, there was a project that we were tasked to do, uh, what, that was to reduce motorcycle theft and the municipal council for years was trying to reduce motorcycle theft and uh, after a few years they got in touch with us and then we said yep it's something that we will probably explore we did and what we did was we got in touch with people who used to steal bikes and we said hey can you teach us how this happens and the next question is uh, what would make it difficult for you to commit this crime right and so they, they gave their, their opinions on it and said oh, okay so we took that knowledge and we came up with preventive measures. So we designed something and I think at the end of the day when we they implemented it into a pilot project area, uh, they were actually able to reduce motorcycle theft to about, I think, a reduction of 32%, give or take, about that figure. So uh, what we actually learned was, and I have to say this, uh, crooks are, are genius, right? They, they are able to figure out things which... Uh, a, a normal person like you and me might might think it's okay or it's secure enough and these guys have a different way of viewing the world and, and, and how things work and that that has I think uh, one of the few things which I probably learned from them is is how to view the world in a different perspective. Why are these criminals open to talking like these bike thefts? Well, I, of course, now when we talk about it, it sounds like, like it's a very easy process, right? Oh, I just go and ask and, and they tell. No, actually, it comes with a bit of, of uh, it, it's not as straightforward as it's supposed to be, right? There's a process to it. There's a process of, of uh, I wouldn't say negotiation, but making them feel comfortable enough that it's okay to share it with me, right? Uh, that's one part of it. Uh, but there's also that process of making them feel, uh, you know, you, you don't have to, agree with everything they say but to a large extent you understand what they are going through and that creates a bit of a bond I would say or, or, or a little bit of comfort between them and us and that's how we get them to talk a little bit about it and and, and from there we are able to you know uh, get 
the necessary information. So it's a long process uh, of building trust, first of all. It's, it's a long process of building trust. Uh, and from there, we're able to understand how they're able to do these things. So your specialty, or one of your specialties, is SEBTED, or Crime Prevention yep. Through Environmental Design. So yep. could you explain first what that is, and also how the work you're doing with talking to criminals uh, has helped uh, inform that so that it's more ah. effective? Okay, uh, very good question. Uh, so what SEPTED is CPTED, Crime Prevention Through Environmental Design, so this is something that was probably born in like the 19, 1800s, 1900s, long time ago, right? And, and it's so interesting to see what they spoke about is that how you design the neighborhood is actually what reduces crime. It's not so much of putting CCTVs on every corner, that doesn't reduce crime. But how you design the neighborhood not only reduces crime, but reduces fear of crime. So you're talking about natural surveillance, a little bit of boundaries, access, uh, maintenance, management, those sort of things, right? So that actually ties back to a lot of what we were, what we talk about today, in the sense of how does a community keep, uh, how how do we build communities, how do we transform communities, and how does that help reduce crime? Uh, and what we've done is by learning straight from the grassroots, learning straight from criminals, we are able to understand on how uh, criminals would, would it, how would it be difficult for crime to breed in certain neighborhoods. So what we do with that, once we understand how difficult it is for crime to breed in certain neighborhoods, we try to implement that in those neighborhoods. So what, what is an example of like a change? So for example, if um, you look at, at um, an area which has a lot of trees, for example, but it's not well, well maintained, right? So what happens is, just say you have street lights, but you have this vegetation which has overgrown. What happens with that is, instead of the street lights brightening up the roads or the streets, what has happened now, everything is dim because of the vegetation or the trees that have grown and is blocking the lighting, right? So one of the concepts of SEPTED is maintenance and management. So maintenance would go back to the point of you should trim those trees, keep it well well, uh, well lit. So that way they still lighting. You know how people are more fearful of the night than, than the than day? So the same thing. And the type of lights you use. Uh, nowadays that's why people say don't use just orange lights anymore. Everybody uses white LED lights right? because it creates a different mindset. It creates a different psychology on the fear of crime. So that, that's one of the simple examples, I think, uh, that would be easy e easy to be shared. Um, yeah, so one of the examples. If you had to, we actually did this uh, exercise at ISGP, the Institute for Studies in Global Prosperity, designing a futuristic village from the ground uh, up. So what elements okay. would it have? Uh, what would be there and to actually promote community? So I'm wondering about that question, but looking at crime prevention. So if you had to yep. design a village or a city from the ground up uh, to both okay. reduce crime, but also promote community, how would you do that? Okay, interesting. I'm sure during ISGP, you guys had more time to think about this. Uh, <laughs> it would be on the spot here. But but I, I think just, just uh, out of a few things, one of it would be, when it goes back to SEPTED, CPTED, uh, the concept of natural surveillance, uh, which basically talks about you don't put objects that could prevent you from seeing things. That way, you know, if somebody is trying, I'm not saying you need to see into your neighbor's house, but you can at least see f to the front of your neighbor's house. So if you see, hey, a car is loitering around there, that doesn't look like my neighbor's car, something is up, you know, to call the police. But also, is that it is not too private that you do not know your neighbors right you want to build communities you have to get to know your neighbors and that's why in the writings it talks about you should always have meaningful conversation and not just conversation right because what happens if just conversation it can be ideal gossip whereas meaningful conversation creates that bond so that, that that's one of the things right so when it comes to septet septet talks a lot about community activities as well so 
any form of activity that generates the uh, the community uh, or, or generates some sort of liveliness in the community i think that's good right so uh yeah maybe if i had to design something it would start off with the concept of natural surveillance the next would be some sort of activity within the community all right could you tell me about the the first criminal you talked to uh, i can't even remember who was the first one um but but i would say this um i can probably tell you the first criminal that uh, probably created a bit of fear in me uh, so I, I I've had the uh, the privilege of interviewing quite a few different types of criminals, and um, I, I I usually am not a big believer in uh, you know people say oh the aura the aura you bring out I, I was never a big believer of that until one day I was sitting down in the room in the room um, and I was interviewing these criminals they were going in and out one by one coming in and suddenly. One of these guys just walked into the room. He was next to be interviewed. He walked in, and the whole atmosphere of the room just changed. He didn't do anything. He he came. He smiled at me, sat down. He was polite. We had a, a brief conversation, but I just wanted to end it fast. But that whole atmosphere in the room just changed. You know, I was like, oh my god, you just can feel how dangerous this guy is, right? So. Uh, I think I also didn't want to be in that room too long with him, so we, we kind of wrapped it up. But it was one; it's probably one of the uh, shorter interviews that I've had. Uh, but yeah, I, 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 among among many people that I've sat down with, I, I probably remember him. Uh, I, I don't remember how he looks like. I just remember the feeling he gave. So that that was one of the more interesting ones. But I can't remember who was the first person I ever, first criminal I ever interviewed. What was it about this guy? I mean, what had he done? And oh yeah, he was a murderer. He was a murderer. Yeah, yeah. So he's murdered people and all, but but it's just a vibe that he gave. What? Yeah, a friend of mine who lived in Alaska, which is very north in U the United States, where there's a lot of wilderness. He was telling me that when hiking through the woods, the uh, sometimes and the most scary times are when everything gets quiet the birds stop chirping the bugs stop making noise uh. <laughs> because that's when there's a huge predator around either a bear or a moose and so it's not the noise that scares you but the lack the si the lack of noise oh that's so interesting right it's, it's so interesting how mother nature works right that uh, suddenly if everything goes quiet is that all these other uh, animals and all, they just know something is off. Uh, but, but such an interesting analogy to share as well, right? That, that uh, in, my, in Mother Nature, if things go quiet, uh, you probably need to be very careful as well. Yeah. So th this murderer, was he the scariest person you've met? Oh, I, I wouldn't say he's the scariest. He just gave up one of the worst vibes, I guess. Uh, but in terms of, of um, I would say... Um, damage is done, I think, to, to people or to society. Probably not the worst. I, I've met way worse people. Uh, in fact, if you ask me, <coughs> what's interesting is that when we look at at murderers, right, uh, maybe they've killed one person, but that creates fear of crime. Uh, we didn't, it can create fear of crime in a whole community, right? That one guy can create fear of crime in a whole community. But what's actually worse is uh, the other elements of crime that are in society that actually kills it, for example, drugs, right? Um, no real fear of crime. Somebody selling drugs, you're not going to be afraid of someone that's selling drugs, right? But the effect of drugs to a community is way worse than one person murdering one person, right? The effects of it is way worse uh, because when you uh, when you when you talk about murderers, maybe he's a one-time he, he killed somebody one time. So it just caused the loss of one life. But drugs, not only does it affect uh, a person's life, it affects a community, right? Because it just kills everything. It kills moral, it kills structure. 
um, yeah so it kills families uh, so yeah so sometimes when you look at things like this um, it's interesting to say that a person can give off or person can can who is a criminal and you have a certain perception of that person but we fail to understand the other elements of crime that affect society at large in um in your area what what does drugs or what does the drug trade actually look like because in the u.s it's a lot of uh, well ma- mainly right now the problem is fentanyl which a lot of people mm. are taking and yep. dying from uh our side is is synthetic drugs is one of the bigger issues around here uh, heroin is a bit of an issue as well uh, but the drug trade, I know, in, in comparison to the U.S., U.S. is quite heavy. Uh, you've got very interesting uh, shows as well, uh, TV shows as well, that have depicted the drug trade and all. Of course, the more famous one was Narcos and all, that actually showed how uh, cocaine came into the U.S. and all. Uh, but yeah, but it, it's, of course, a very... Uh, I think the drug trade is one of the more uh, complex ones, as there are just so many moving parts uh, to the drug trade. Of course, when we talk about like, like fraud, and, and the drug trade and all, they are both equally complex, right? So, um, yeah, but but at the end of the day, it doesn't matter if it's what type of drug, it doesn't matter if it's synthetic drug or, or natural drugs, drug is drug and, and there is effects to society. And I think there's a lot of evidence that has shown that uh, when drugs come into a certain area of society, it really does affect that society. It doesn't just affect an individual. It does, there, there's a snowball effect to it. Or, or ripple effect, as people would say to it. Uh, so, yeah. So, one of the things, that's why they always say stay away from drugs, don't do drugs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, you can definitely see like the effect on the individual, on their soul. The yep. passages from the Kitabi Akdas and also from Abdul Baha on the use of opium are some of the scariest I've seen in the Baha'i writings. Yep. But then it's also the effect on the family and yep. society at large. Yep. So, of course, uh, when you look at the writings as well, there's always some sort of uh, wisdom behind it, right, uh, on, on why we should not be, be doing this. You know, um, e- even the use of alcohol, for example, the consumption of alcohol, when we look at it, you know, people might say, oh, it's okay, you know, uh, my tolerance is high, I don't cause a ruckus, and all. But what people don't understand is also, first of all, uh, what effect it has on the body and the soul, that's one. Right? I, I think people understand more of what effect it has on the body in comparison to the soul. But also what people don't understand is the whole ecosystem that it creates when we have this sort of illicit uh, um, sort of uh, items like drugs, alcohol and all. There's a whole, there's a whole uh, ecosystem over there right? that goes... Uh, you know, you will have people who are going to start smuggling. You are going to have people who are going to start creating uh, bootleg uh, alcohol, you know, drugs, and so on and so forth. Uh, so you, 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 and then you're going to have people who are just going to be addicted to it. So there's always a lot of wisdom when we look back at, at I think writings, or not only the Baha'i writings, but I think of any religion, there is wisdom behind it on why we should not do these sort of things. Yeah, and I'm sure you've seen uh, some horrible crime or horrible criminals related to drugs and alcohol. It's not just users, but then like the the distribution. And uh, you mentioned in your talk uh, meeting the the head of um, competition management in one drug or uh, <laughs> drug gang. Yeah, uh, you know, but when 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 we meet these sort of people, of course, there, there's uh, uh, it's interesting to hear their stories as well. Uh, but it's also, I think, interesting to learn uh, from a point of when we see these guys and all, there's no sense of judgment towards them when we do it. I think that that's one of the reasons why they're okay with sharing with us, right? We are just there and tell them, look, I don't care why you did this, but I would like to learn how you've been doing this. And uh, just teach me what, what, what you know, t- talk me through the process, tell me a little bit about your families. You know, we just start to get to know them a bit. So I think because they know I am not there to judge them, and, and who am I to judge them, right? Uh, 
Hey, only God can judge you. So I'm not there to say, hey, what you've been doing is wrong. Do you know you've been killing families? They know that, right? But it's their choice on, on what they're doing. What we can do from our side is to see, okay, now you know there's a segment of society that's going to contribute to this sort of, um, how would I say, uh, this sort of, the, or contribute to some part of the downfall of society or communities. Now what can we do to help build that community before it crumbles? So that is why it's so important to sometimes understand it from the other side, right? We are usually looking at things from one perspective. Okay, this neighborhood is not good. Let's see what we can do to build this neighborhood. Let's see what we can do to transform this neighborhood. But we've never really gone to the other side of things to understand from the grassroots. Well, what's interesting is the the writing always talks about go, the house six goes to the grassroots, go to the grassroots, right? But are we really going to the grassroots or are we selective of the type of grassroots we are going to, right? So if we really go to the grassroots, which is uh, where these sort of things stem from, the people who are doing it, right? Not Don't always just go to the people who are on the receiving end. Don't go to the users. Let's go to the distributors. Let's figure it out from their side, okay? So now we understand if they are doing ABC, what can we do to help build it from ABC or continue from DEF, right? So we need to understand that part of it for us to help build communities. Are there, uh, do you have an example of something that you learn like talking to criminals that then kind of showed a lack that can then be addressed in the community? Like you mentioned, uh, like the question, tell me about your family. Yeah. Or your upbringing, things like that. Okay, actually, actually, there's a very interesting, I think, study that was done somewhere in the U.S. Um, with prisoners. And one of the things I think uh, that that has happened in the U.S. that there's a lot of uh, single parent homes, right? And one of the things that was interesting about this study, it showed that. Um, the amount of offenders uh, from you've got uh, dual parent families, single mom, single dad, right? The amount of offenders uh, that are in prison from uh, single fathers are the same with those with dual parents. So the amount of offenders of those who are single, who came from single mother homes were higher, right? What that showed. It, it in no way does it so please don't take what i'm saying out of context but in no way does it say single mothers are not good but what it shows is that what this research shows is that the important role of the father in the household so that was an interesting thing but also what it also showed was that or, or to some extent it showed that because a lot of these kids grew up without a father figure what they've understood as a father figure is somewhat an illusion of what their mother has shared with them because they are different partners, they are different father figures in different parts of their life. So they don't really understand what a real father figure should be like. right? So And that is one of the contributors. right? So because in general, a lot of, a lot of homes, the father is seen as the disciplinarian. right? He's the protector. Right? And and that also, to a large extent, probably contributes to the re reduction of crime within communities, right? Uh, so you need this. This when, when we look at okay, what could help communities? Sometimes is a good family unit. Uh, that that's one of the things that I would say. A, 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 a strong family unit is important. Or if it's not a strong family unit, it takes a village. Like they always, the saying always goes right. It takes a village to raise a child, right? So that that really that really plays an important role. It takes a village to to teach a child uh, to raise a child. It also takes a village to keep a child safe. That that it goes together. A lot of times, like oh no, we just raised the child. No, you have to keep the child safe as well. So um, the, the community plays a very big aspect, right? We cannot always be expecting uh, homes to always have both both parents. Unfortunately, you are going to have single mothers, single fathers. But the community plays a big role. Absolutely. 
and I think the the scientific findings are pretty clear on like childhood outcomes from different types of homes, and yep. uh, this is looking at the averages. But then uh, like you also see what happens to particularly young boys who then become young men who don't have a strong father figure where uh, they need that positive male role model. And if it yep. doesn't come from their family or maybe a, a children's class teacher, or junior youth animator, then yep. they'll get it from somewhere. And uh, then it could be within a gang or yep. uh, doing other bad activities. Exactly. You know, in the, um, in the junior youth program, uh, junior spiritual empowerment program one of the things it talks about the importance of going through uh, of having this group the, the, this uh, this group of youths together uh, and having an older youth to make sure that they don't go astray right the idea behind it is that okay this is a good role model for me at this point of time I, I'm a junior youth I'm not a kid I'm not a youth yet now I'm in the middle stage where do I go where do I go so by at least looking up to one of the older youths who are who's a good role model in 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 the community is what people strive to be at least they'll say okay at least i i i don't maybe i might not want to grow up to be like him but at this point of time he is what i would like to look up to or she he or she either all right yeah yeah we're right now we're talking about the importance of education and i think we'll uh we'll touch on that more later on i want to ask you about the the question or the idea of evil so abdul baha states that all evil is mere non-existence that good has positive existence and evil is merely its af- evil is merely its absence so you've yeah. talked to uh, murderers talked to rapists serial yeah. uh, sexual abusers so what have you learned about evil Huh. Well, very interesting question. So, uh, like what the writing says, evil is is the non-existence, right, of of good, right. So, uh, I think what what's very interesting is is probably is that uh, when there is some form of lust, uh, and, and and it could be sexual lust, it could be lust of uh, you know anger, uh, so on and so forth. There is somehow a lack of self-control. So I wouldn't say to a large extent. Um, well, I would. Hmm, you, well, what happens is that because of that lack of self-control, or the pursuit of something which is only of self-interest, right? When you talk about trafficking, why would someone traffic another person? It's pure self-interest. So because of the lack of those few things. Um, these guys committed. Uh, can I say that there is a lack uh, or, or there is pure evil in them? I wouldn't know. Right? I wouldn't know. But I think there's probably some truth to the uh, There is definitely truth to the writings of Abdul Baha. Um, but it, it is the lack or, or the non existence of it that probably um, contributes to all this. Right? There, there is actions which are very selfish. And that's probably the cause of it. Yeah. Well, the Baha'i writings make mention of Satan and the devil. And it's not that we believe that there's a literal red-skinned, horned figure, but uh, it's more metaphorical, often referring to the self or the lower nature. Yep. Yep. Definitely. I I think... The, the part about the lower nature is, is probably very, very accurate. Yeah. Can you tell me about pirates? Ah, okay. So, one thing which I've learned, I think, from pirates is that um, their line of work, they look at it as, as a pure form of business. right? Uh, of course, we've seen a lot of incidences where things have gotten violence, uh, violent and not. But one thing I've realized a lot with, with a lot of criminals is that um, putting putting rapists and all aside, eh? but when we talk about pirates and all, uh, it's a pure form of business because the monetary value at the end of it, the payout is actually quite huge, right? Uh, so, 
to them is like, huh, this is my life. Um, this is the easiest way I'm going to earn a living for myself and my family. So piracy is 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 their way of life. It's their profession to say. Uh, so I think to simply put, it, it's, it's their profession. Um, and they look at it. I, I've sat out with some pirates who have told me, look, for me, it's straight up, right? We don't kill anyone. Our job is to just go hijack the ship and get the money out of it. Um, and we, we have not caused harm. Of course, here and there, there are scuffles. People get hurt in the process. We've had to hit people just to keep everyone under control. But it's just to me, it's, it's a business transaction. I hijack the ship. I hijack a ship and uh, I demand the payout. When I get the payout, I release the ship. So to some people, they look at it. But, I, but they are, of course, more violent pirates and all. But uh, not the ones I have met. Uh, to them, it's all been a business transaction. So I think that goes back to maybe the previous part of the conversation where we spoke about uh, it's all about self-interest. Um, and uh, it's it's a very large uh process or, or a very large aspect of it is it comes from monetary necessities or the need for monetary gain yeah you've you said that uh, many criminals are businessmen just their business yeah. is crime yes <laughs> yes um, so i actually uh, i i i didn't i i didn't come up with a term that uh, their business is crime. There was actually a, a former London uh, uh, gangster who said, "You know, my my, my business is crime. I, I'm not uh, I'm not a I'm not a criminal. I'm not a gangster. I'm a businessman, and my business is crime, right? Uh, I think his name was Bobby something, right? So uh, he that that was the way he looked at it, right? He said, "Look, um, it's a transaction. Somebody needs something done. I get it done in the process." People might get hurt, but that's the line of business I'm in, right? So that that's how some of them look at it. Uh, I, I'm sure there are a lot of other professions as well that that would be in line to a large extent on that. Um, so you know, to him, he looks at it like, okay, somebody needs, for example, a car, right? They cannot afford a brand new one, but they can afford one which is uh, stolen. So there is demand i'm going to help create the supply so with anything that happens as well all right especially when it comes to to crime why they look at it as a form of business is because of the demand right if there is no demand for stolen cars there's not going to be stolen cars if there's no demand for for fraudulent items there's not going to be if there's no demand for drugs there's not going to be drugs there's no demand for alcohol there's not going to be alcohol right so in anything that has demand, they will. Somebody will come up with the supply, right? But there has to be the demand. So, talking about supply and demand, then it also comes back to us, right? As society, why have we created that demand, uh, and what can we now do to reduce that demand so that when when demand is less, supply goes off? So, what are some of those things like? Would that mean? Like, could you unpack that? Okay, so um, let's talk about human trafficking, for example, right? Let's talk about human trafficking, and and we'll go a bit deeper. Human trafficking for the sex trade, right? We're not trafficking people for labor. Let's say we're trafficking people for the sex trade, right? And the reason why that happens is because there's demand. Uh, there was this this. Uh, this movie called The Whistleblower, and it's based on a true story about this uh, this person who was assigned to Bosnia. And when she went there, and she realized, huh, there are actually quite a lot of women here that are selling themselves in the sex trade. And someone passed a comment, and she says, no, who do you think this these people are for, right? The men in Bosnia are dead. Who are these women servicing? And they realized, actually, they were servicing the officers that were there, the peacekeepers that were there, right? This is is, is a movie that was out. I, I think uh, there was a very it was a very famous movie. It's called The Whistleblower. Oh, you should check it out, right? So there was demand for women, so somebody found a supply for it, right? And they were trafficked uh, into the sex trade. So yeah, so when there is supply, there is demand. 
when people decide that I we don't want this anymore, that's where the supply ends. So it fundamentally comes down to the morals and the spiritual values of the people in the society. Uh, if people are averse to drugs, then yep. naturally those will disappear. Yes. If, if people are saying, look, I don't want... Um, I, I, I don't want to buy pirated goods, then that dies off, right? If people say, I, I don't want to to have uh, sexual relationships outside of my marriage, then that goes off, right? There is no need for all these women. If people say, I don't want, uh, you know, women to, to, uh, to be uh, having maybe stripped, strip bars i i don't want that right i uh and and people just stop thinking that that's appealing then that goes off right so it, it all comes down to what society wants and 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 it moves from there if society wants something good it will move in the right direction if society wants something bad it moves in that direction yeah uh, kind of moving moving on so one of the core tenets of the Baha'i faith is the elimination of all forms of prejudice. And yep. Could you tell me about the role that crime plays in creating prejudices and then also how that can be fixed? Oh, okay, actually, uh, that's interesting, right? It talks, uh, the writing talks about eliminating prejudice, but what crime does is that it increases prejudice. So, um, for example, Right. If if you were robbed uh, one day by someone of, of color, let's say so I I'm I'm of I am a Malaysian and just say you were robbed by a Malaysian, right? So the next time you walk on the street and you see somebody who resembles even the slightest qualities of me, you would have some sort of fear or resentment towards me. The same would apply just say if you were robbed again by another Malaysian, and let's say now you are a uh, a di uh, or you're a hiring manager in a company and you're running an interview with someone that looks like me or ha resembles my quality, there's going to be that preconceived prejudice of like, oh, Malaysians are like that. We don't want to hire Malaysians, right? Or you would have that sort of prejudice. So I might not have done anything to you, but somebody who resembles my features did. And because of that, I might lose a job, which I was probably more than qualified to, to hold. Right? So, uh, a lot of people don't realize the trauma it brings and also the subtle prejudice that you might have. We might say, no, I don't have prejudice, but it's probably embedded and, and you are just not aware of it until the time comes. And then you realize, huh, I, I, I didn't realize I had this sort of preconceived notions about people. Um, and it was probably due to some sort of criminal incident that happened in your life. Yeah, I think there's definitely, the brain is always looking for patterns. And yep. even when those patterns are erroneous, I, I think that these prejudices are created by uh, kind of, I don't know if I'd say the more baser part, the more instinctual parts of our brain. Yeah, I knew this... Um, I had a teacher who, who owned a dog whose previous owner uh, had abused it. And that that man, he, uh, he had a darker complexion. And so the dog, every time it saw someone of a similar complexion, it would get angry, it would bark. And so we used to joke that the dog was racist. And <laughs> in, in many ways, it was. But it was, that was yeah. just how it... Uh, understood the world yep. because it saw that abuser in in people who looked similar to him but we yep. have the the ability to to transcend that to recognize the soul that's in every person to judge them for who they are not uh, what their background is or who they might yep. look like yes definitely uh, but I think you said something very interesting right is that what we need to look into is the soul of a person, not the person, how they look like on the outside, right? So I, I, I think you, you're probably spot on in what you've just said. Ah, well, thank you. Uh, yeah. Kind of on that topic of the soul and life, what 
can cause a human to take another person's life? Oh, oh that is such a good question. Um, you know, I it it's I think comes back to the one thing is that the understanding of the value of a life. So to take a person's life is not easy. But if you do not see any value in that person's life, then it's just somehow so easy to do it next, right? So it, it always goes down to the understanding of what we've been taught that the value of a life is. What we've always been taught is that, hey, don't do don't don't kill a person because it's wrong. Don't don't rape a person because it's wrong. But we don't teach people that, hey, don't murder a person because that life has a value. Uh, and I think the question always comes back is how do we educate people on what the value of a life is? Uh, and, and I think to whoever is listening, um, I, I would really appreciate if you could share with me your thoughts on it as well. Right? How would you uh, educate people on the value of life? But but maybe Basi, you would like to share with me maybe what what are your thoughts on how do we value a person's life? I think it comes down to uh, spiritual teaching, children's class, junior youth empowerment. Uh, I'm thinking about Ruhi Book One, Reflections on the Life of the Spirit, where we go through the Baha'i writings on a number of topics, including the soul and the afterlife and yeah. our relationship to uh, to God in that way, where um, uh, Baha'u'llah uh, talks about well, how how he's created us noble, and yep. that in um, says, "O son of man, veiled in my immemorial being, and in the ancient eternity of my essence, I knew my love for thee. Therefore, I created thee, having graved on thee mine image and revealed to thee my beauty." So, if we recognize that yep. we ourselves were made uh, in the image of God, reflecting with the ability to reflect. Uh, all of God's attributes, then uh, these attributes and virtues such as kindness, love, truthfulness, justice, that we can then extend that. You have to extend that to others because, okay, if if I was made in this way, that means you are also and everyone around as well. I, I, I think that that's very interesting and, and what you've said is, is very true, right? How do we then look into the soul of a person and say, hey, you, know, you and me are no different. Your life is as valuable as mine. And and uh, I don't think that what I I should be doing this to you, for example. right? So from a very young age, um, I think, you know, so when people say, oh, you know, uh, we, we, some people might be a bit sensitive about religion. But what I would say is at the end of the day, you know, it, you just need to understand from a, at least a spiritual aspect. If, if you're not a religious person, it's fine, but at least you need to understand it from a spiritual aspect on the value of that life and the value of that soul. Uh, irregardless of what religion you are, race, religion you are, um, every religion still talks about uh, the importance of, of a person's soul, right? And, and that's why it talks about you should pray because that's like conversation with God, you know. But uh, like we said, from a young age, we should be educating people on the value of a life, uh, and 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 not that, uh, and and not just okay, it's wrong to do it to a person, but why we should actually be loving that person for that person, and and not just look at the punishment behind it, but what we should be looking at is how do we preserve that life. Something interesting that came to mind for me as you were speaking is what Abdul Baha talks about in regards to education and how that through education uh, we can transcend our animal nature. And he says, well, there's certain things that distinguish us from animals, uh, those being our abilities for, uh, for thought, for imagination, comprehension, memory. But then, if since we have these capacities, if we don't act on them, then if we don't develop the spiritual qualities, then we're actually lower than animals who operate purely on instinct. So yep. what do you think about that idea that we can actually become lower than animals? 
if we I, I think some of us already are <laughs> the way the way we've been committing crime and the way we've been acting I think some of us are already worse than animals in fact I think uh, some some animals have shown more compassion than humans have right um, I, I I've been to some parts of the world where uh, it was very interesting to see how how compassionate they were towards animals but not towards people uh, so uh, yeah, so sometimes, like, but but you know, speaking of education as well, and, and you said something interesting about what Abdul Baha said as well. But that's why in the Baha'i writings it, it says, you know, where if you have the ability to educate one person in the family, if it's a boy or girl, educate the girl first because she's the first educator of the child, and and that's so important because at the end of the day, you know, the mother shares compassion with people. She she teaches children how to be compassionate, how to be loving, and. And that's what we need as well, right? So that that's why you know it, it's so interesting in the Bible faith when it talks about when it comes to education, women get get privilege over men, and maybe that's the wisdom behind it. What we need to kid, teach our kids is love and compassion, and it needs to start with that. Yes, it, it's interesting looking at the Baha'i conception of education and family and marriage, where. Uh, there is that role for uh, for the mother as the primary educator. But then uh, there's also, that's not to discount the role of the father, as you mentioned earlier with the studies about uh, yep. kids raised in fatherless homes. But then uh, Baha'u'llah describes the institution as of marriage. He uses the phrase that it uh, it's to set the world in order, that marriage itself is a structure that will bring about order in the world. And I can't help but see parallels between that statement and what you're describing with uh, the order in society and it's linked to crime with that. Yeah. Uh, you know, you know that, that, that's why one of the things about when Baha'u'llah talks about the institution of marriage, he says, you know, uh, marriage is, uh, is also to bring forth a child to know him and to worship him. To worship God, right? So, uh, most of the time, the idea is, of course, when when you are worshiping God, you also are able to uh, try to understand, like what you said earlier, right? We are all built in the image of His essence. So, when we understand that a bit better, we would understand the value of a life. Yes. Uh, turning to a more personal level, uh, how has uh, the work that you've done personally affected you, seeing these darker parts of humanity. Oh, uh, so a few things, right? I, I I think it has various effects, of course. Uh, some people that hang out with me say, "Oh my God, Shami, you're you're too you're too paranoid." I I don't think I'm paranoid. I'm just cautious. <laughs> so uh, that, that's one part of it, right? Uh, I think. It helps on, on various levels. One is that because we've seen, I would say, parts or, or some of the worst parts of, of, of humanity, some, some of the worst parts of humanity, it gives us a better understanding when we approach Ruhi books, when we approach children's classes, when we approach JY programs, because now we understand certain realities that people are going through. Uh, which probably I would not have understood previously. If I were to go into certain neighborhoods and, and I would say, oh, I don't understand why people here are all uh, involved in the drug trade. No, I don't understand. But now I do. right? And that would help me when I'm doing maybe the JY program or children's classes or Ruhi. It would help me relate to them a bit better. So I think there are, of course, pros and cons to 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 what we've done in the sense of since I've seen some of the worst parts of society of course uh, like I said you know maybe when I go to certain areas I, I'm extra cautious subconsciously I'm just extra cautious right but also what it has given me is a few things right it has given me the ability or uh, the the very uh, it's given me the, 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 the ability to at least come up or to work with communities and, and to help transform those communities it has given me the ability to at least look at things differently and and help reduce victimization 
It has given me the ability to <clears throat> look at things from a different perspective, from a broader perspective, and that's what criminals usually do. They always look at things from a broader perspective, right? So, you see, one thing I've learned from criminals is they're actually the least prejudiced people ever you'll ever meet, right? A criminal couldn't care less if you're white or black. He'll rob you. <laughs> so he's not going to say, man, I'm Indian, you're Indian, I'm not going to rob you. No, he couldn't care less. Uh, so they're the least prejudiced people. So I think one of the things which I probably learned from them is not <laughs> is to make sure I'm not prejudiced towards anyone. Uh, so they are not. Uh, but yeah, these are probably some of the things I've learned. I, I think it's given me uh, the the privilege and the ability to maybe work in, in, in some rough and tough neighborhoods. And probably that, that is probably my path of service. So uh, you also, you've mentioned that prayer has helped you get through difficult times. I don't know if yep. you're willing to share, unpack some of that. Yep. that. Not a problem. So, of course, sometimes when we sit down with, with, with these uh, criminals and all, and they share with you some of the stories in detail, it gets to you, right? Mentally, it does get to you. But in that moment, you cannot react to it in a negative manner because then it cuts off that whole connection that you've built, right? So once we are done, once I'm done interviewing them and I'm out of that space, in order to de-stress. So one of the things is that I, I've been fortunate enough to be maybe given good mental strength, right? Mental strength, but also mental health is important as well. And that's where prayer comes in, in very handy. Uh, the need to sit down and just pray and and that helps with a little bit of the mental health aspect of things. Yeah, so I would have to say I, I've had a few outlets uh, in in with what I do, sports was very important to me. Uh, it was one of the outlets. I, I used to sit down and watch a lot of comedy. I still do. Uh, that's one of the outlets. And prayer was one of the main outlets. Yeah. I don't know. Are you willing to share any stories of uh, people or criminals you talked to where it really affected you? Um, well, I'm trying to think of, of, of maybe an example. Um... But yeah, okay. Maybe I can share with you one of it. Um, I interviewed someone who sexually abused his own daughter a few hundred times, right? So, uh, and and when we went through the whole process of it, you know, of course, sometimes the details come out and all, and and it's icky to hear, right? So, I don't want to go back home and go to bed with those thoughts. Um, so that's where. Uh, you know, I get back, wash up. In fact, even before I got back, I remember that one when I reached the car park. I was, when I reached my car in the parking lot, I just sat there and I said prayers first. And then I had to drive back, right? So on, on the way back, of course, your mind starts reflecting on the things you've spoken about as well. So you get back home, another round of prayers, and, and that's, that helped a little bit. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I, I definitely see why why that can could really affect your soul deeply like there's yep. certain i know even like just taking that moment to detach no matter what it is uh that definitely helps in prayer yep. uh, conversation with god I see how that could very much uh help uplift you after being kind of in a in a dark place or with yep. with dark people yep so moving forward, uh, I, I learned about this study that uh, a bunch of people or people were videotaped just walking normally. And then those videos were shown to uh, different groups, inclu including a group of prisoners. So the prisoners were independently. They were asked what people would they target? So who would they rob? Who would they try to steal from? Or who would they even assault? Just looking at the footage of them and independently the uh the criminals kind of agreed on who they would go after like they all sought out the same victims uh, so like w what do you think about this so of course there are certain characteristics that that um criminals look out for when they want to maybe mug a person 
or steal a person's bag, right? What they will always look out for are people that uh, they know they can overpower or people that they know are not going to react the way, uh, they, they are going to react in the way they want them to react. So uh, that's the thing, right? What What's going to be interesting is that there is no one, say, one specific way to protect yourself. You can be the toughest guy on the block and yet you can still be the victim, right? So how, it, sometimes people ask me, oh, Shamir, what do I need to do to make sure I don't be a victim? I, I tell, always tell them, be cautious, uh, be up to date, be aware on what's currently going on. It doesn't mean you go to the gym and, and you learn uh, martial arts, you're going to be able to, to keep yourself safe. There's always going to be someone with a gun. You're not going to be able to stop a bullet, right? So uh, a few things, right? Of course, you always look at the area you're at, uh, the type of activities you're involved in. Uh, if you're involved in antisocial activities, you are probably going to invite some form of danger. Right? So uh, you have to look at where you're at, the type of activities you're doing, who you're with, and, and those are certain things that you need to know to make sure that at least to a large extent, you reduce the risk of you becoming a victim. Uh, on a different subject, uh, what have you seen with regards to children committing crime? Uh, so, so this is very interesting, right? Because uh, in the writings, uh, especially when you look at book three and all, uh, what Abdul Baha says is that, uh, you know, uh, no child is incorrigible, you know, children are pure, so on and so forth. And then you see these kids committing crime, right? So uh, a large portion of it is, so there, 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 there's a criminology theory, there are two criminology theories. Uh, one is called the latent trait theory and one more is called the life cause theory. Uh, the latent trait theory states that some kids are just born with criminal tendencies. And the life cause theory says it's due to incidences in their life that, commit them, uh, that cause them to commit crime. But what both these theories agree on is that with proper love and guidance, from parents or the community, they can have these criminal tendencies, they can have the worst upbringing in life, but with proper love and guidance, they will not commit crime. Right? So it, it actually boils down to a lot of it comes on education. So when you see kids committing crime, they are emulating it from somewhere. right? It, it, a kid will not go, know how to go up and rob a person. right? Uh, a child will not know how to go up and rape a person. Right. So they have to have seen something in order for them to emulate it. Right? Uh, if you want to say a child stabbed another child, probably due to accident, right? because they don't understand, <clears throat> again, goes back to education, yeah? they don't understand the effects of hurting another person. Right? So all of these things play a role in the education of a child. And that's why you know, the writing says children are, 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 are born innocent. It is the environment, and, and again, like we shared earlier, it, it relates back to these criminological theories, which are scientific, that the environment plays a big factor. But again, with proper love and guidance, uh, you will not have these children commit this crime. So there are a lot of cases where children are involved in crime, but the best way to combat it is through proper love and guidance. And that's why when we look back at, at what's probably one of the ways that effect, that's effective is children's classes are effective, the junior youth spiritual program is, expect, is effective, and these are what kids should be involved in. Have you seen actually on the ground transformation either in individuals or in communities as a result of those programs? I, I actually have. I have actually. I, I'll share this with you with uh, one of the JY programs, the junior youth spiritual empowerment program, one of it. Um, and me and my buddy were, were firstly were animators for this program, and one of the one of these junior youth, after completing one of the books, uh, he came up to us and told us, uh, you know, since I've been doing this, I just want to share with you, I've stopped drinking alcohol. And we're like, no, you were drinking alcohol. It's like, how old are you, right? <laughs> and this kid was like 12, 13, right? And and he was he was drinking alcohol, not 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 like he was an alcoholic, but he used to drink alcohol since you know after going through his pro pro program we did breezes of confirmation and and he said you know i i, I stopped I, I don't want to do this anymore so that was probably one of the one of the things uh 
Another one was from one of the female participants in, in another group. Uh, they came from very rough neighborhoods. And when after going through the breezes of confirmation again, they said, you know, um, whatever it is, I need to make sure I'm educated to be able to leave this neighborhood. I don't want to grow up in this neighborhood, nor do I want my family to be to continue growing in this neighborhood because society is not what I, I want to start new somewhere else. Right. So they understood that, um, of course, it's good if they could have stayed and transformed the neighborhood. But maybe to them, what was more important is to leave first. Maybe later on, they'll come back. But to leave first for their own uh, personal growth. Those are some remarkable stories. I think it, it kind of shows how powerful education can be. You're kind of looking at things from a psychology standpoint. There's, um, I learned about this gene that codes for psychopathy so if you have this gene then there's a chance that you can become uh, a psychopath but with um, epigenetics which is the idea that there's certain genes that are only expressed depending on our environment well this one gene coding for psycho uh, psychopathy it is only expressed it only gets turned on if the individual is abused you see, environment, right? It goes back to the environment. If they are not in an environment that's abusive, that gene doesn't get turned on. Yes. So it's uh, essentially, I mean, I'm I'm saying this as an outsider. Like, it, it, I can't just say, oh, we should stop having abusive homes and they'll just yep. stop. But there is, uh, there is hope in that. You know, Abdul Baha talks about how in the future education will become so effective that crime yeah. will essentially be eliminated. Oh, I, 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 I'm, I'm looking forward to that day, right? The day that I don't have a job is a good day. <laughs> yeah, that, that's good. Uh, yeah. I'll, I'll share a quote from him. This is from The Secret of Divine Civilization, where Abdu'l-Bahá says that the... Uh, he says, the primary, the most urgent requirement is the promotion of education. It is inconceivable that any nation should achieve prosperity and success unless this paramount, this fundamental concern is carried forward. Oh, so beautiful. And, and, and again, I, I totally agree, you know, um, the, the, the right education will definitely help reduce crime. Now, the way you phrase that actually is really interesting because kids will get an education no matter what. Yeah. That's how humans are yeah. wired. <laughs> but it just depends on what they're learning from, who they're learning from, yes. and what qualities are expressed. Yep. So my final question is, uh, what can we learn from criminals? We ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> I I think a few there there are a few good qualities I have to say that I've picked up from criminals right um, the, the the first is mental strength right uh, when was the last time you heard a criminal say oh my god I'm depressed right you 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 you, you don't hear those guys saying that right um, a, another thing is they're go getters so especially do, in, in in anything you do right when they set their minds to it they achieve it right so. Uh, I have to say the same thing as well uh, that that we can adopt, right? Is that when you set your mind to something, you work towards achieving it. Uh, you have to stay up day and night, so be it, but you achieve what you want to achieve. Unfortunately, some of them, their achievement is towards the wrong path, but the same thing can be applied to us, right? If, if just say, um, I, I, my dreams is to be an engineer, I work towards that. Right. So the resilience that criminals have is probably something to be uh, admired and, and, and probably something that if done right can be adopted well. So uh, that is probably something that uh, some of the things that I probably have learned from criminals, right? Uh, one is a little bit of mental strength. Two is uh, resilience. 
and also three is to look at things from a very broad perspective don't be narrow minded and don't have narrow or tunnel vision right look at things from a very very broad perspective so that you look you understand it from different angles yep so maybe those would be the three things uh, that that i probably learned wonderful very well thank you so much i learned so no. much talking to no, you i i i think i have to thank you for taking the effort uh, to do this podcast and to try to promote uh these sort of things and also i think first of all i have to thank you for uh, reaching out and and uh, thinking of even putting this whole thing together i i really look forward to the other interviews that you're going to do and i really look forward to learning from those interviews as well as i hope that uh, many would have uh, learned from this interview as well thank you